glory, risen conquering sun, endless is the victory, thou O death hast won, and no more we doubt of thee, glorious prince of life. Life is not without thee, aid us in our strife. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I'll give you a chance to find that. I think it's like the fifth book in or something like that. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Love the name. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm reading my Bible, uh, a question or a, a thought just jumps into my head. It just kind of springs out at you. And the sermon I'm going to preach to you today was one such thought that jumped out at me about two years ago when I was reading my Bible. And uh, it, I just, I jotted it down, and this past week I just revisited it. And I'll do that from time to time, um, to, you know, to, to finally take a second look and, 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 and see what it has for me. And the sermon I ended up with really had nothing to do with my original thought, but I'm going to be using the verse that came into my mind when I was reading. And it's amazing how God works with us, how He works with our minds, and how He opens things up to us when we're ready to understand them. I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but that's how it works sometimes, is that God, will, you'll, you'll get a message from God through His Word, or you'll hear a sermon, something, and it'll... it'll but then you weren't ready for it, and it just kind of comes to you a little bit later on. And you go, ah, now I get it, now I get it. Um, so Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, and swear that I should not go over Jordan, and that I should not go into that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. But I must die in this land, I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that land, or that good land, shall we pray. Father, again, we thank you as we look into your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to have an open mind, but also more important, help us to have an open heart to actually receive it so that we'll be able to obey it. And so, Father, Lord, help us to learn through the life of Moses this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So upon first read in verse 21, it looks like Moses is blaming the Israelites for God's anger upon them. If you just kind of read it quickly over there, that's what it kind of seems like. Whenever you hear the word furthermore, it is seldom followed by praise. You don't really get words of furthermore, and you don't usually get praised or lifted up from that. Uh, furthermore is a word that normally sets you up for a rebuke that is to follow. And furthermore... And somebody's going to lay it on you uh, there. So in verse 21, it's no different. This furthermore means there's going to be some rebuke. But what might be surprising is that Moses is not rebuking the Israelites. He's not, he's not uh, rebuking these people. He's rebuking himself in front of these people. It's kind of an interesting thing. The reason for this, this self-reproach will be the focus of this message uh, this morning. Uh, but, but to support my argument, I, I want you to, to look at that Moses was rebuking himself and not the Israelites. I, I want us to look back uh, at the verse before it and the verses after. I want us to kind of surround ourselves with the context. So if you go back to the verse 20, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. So here Moses is reminding the people that God's intentions toward them were honorable ones. He was not, God did not want to harm his people. He want, wanted to bless his people. He's reminding them. He says, you are the promised people. And I'm just kind of reminding us today is that God does not hate his children. God is not looking for opportunities to punish us. He's always looking for opportunities to bless us and to give to us the things that we really need. So this is the kind of God we serve. Now, the God of man, and we looked at last week, we looked at Molech a little bit, that, that, that uh, statue in uh, Balaam and, and those, those gods of the, of the Canaanites. Those gods were not nice gods. They demanded sacrifice over and over and over again. And it was like you were on a string and you had to come there like a, just, a, a, it, just begging all the time. Our God is not like that God. Our God is like no other gods. He's the true God. 
And so we see here that God is looking for an opportunity to bless his people. So he also wants to follow through with this promise that he made to Abraham. Now these are all the children, children's children's children of Abraham that God made a promise to. He made a covenant with them. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to make you a great nation. He says, I'm going to give you a promised land. This is for you, for the Jews. He, he had promised these people. And when God makes a promise, he follows through on that promise. When God says, if you receive my son Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you will have eternal life. That does not mean you can lose that. You understand that? Because when God promises something, he carries through with it. Now, I know that there are churches that preach the new birth of Jesus Christ, but they also have strings attached. Like if you do something wrong, and I, I don't know who, how they determine what is wrong or not. If it's really, really bad, I'm like, really? Okay, because in God's eyes, according to the word of God, just the thought. Our thoughts and intents are sin. That'll cast us to hell. But they'll say, but there's strings attached. And if you do something really, really bad, he'll pull that eternal life away from you. Well, that's not the God of Moses. That's not the God of Abraham. He promised these people something, and he was going to deliver. Whether they deserved it or not, he was going to give them that land that he had promised them. And that just, uh, so much of the Old Testament at that time, they didn't know. They're going through this, and they're living through it for the first time. But they were recorded by Moses faithfully so that later on, the other Old Testament prophets could quote him. And they would say, oh yeah, that, that, and then they would start to see the connections. God is faithful. And then when the New Testament came, and John the Baptist came, and when Jesus came, they were all pointing back to what was happening uh, with the, the children of Israel. And so these things were all object lessons that we could use spiritually today, even for us today in this church age that we live in. So God keeps his promises. And this is what Moses is trying to remind them of. So if you, if you look at it in verse 23, so let's move ahead a bit. Deuteronomy 4, verse 23. And this is after Moses announces that he's not going to make it to the promised land. He says, take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant. There's that promise, that covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. Verse 24, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now here Moses is warning the people that their intentions for God must be honorable ones. God's holiness dictates that he will not share he will not share the glory with any created thing. Whether we fashion it in our minds or we fashion it in idols, it doesn't matter in our philosophy, he will not, he will not tolerate that, especially amongst his own people. He will not tolerate any kind of image that we try to make in our own minds that put even on par with God, not let alone above him. And yet people do it all the time. So God will not share his glory with anyone else. And there are 10 times in the Old Testament in which God is proclaimed as being a jealous God. It's kind of an interesting term, jealous God. Uh, it means that he is always watching out for rivals. You see, when you're a jealous person, you're a jealous man, you're, you're looking out for your wife, you're always watching, who's she talking to? And you're, you see, that's, that, that, you're always watching. I want you to picture that with God, not on an earthly term, but on a heavenly term. He is so jealous that we, as his children, will start to look and gaze upon other created things and start to worship them. He is so jealous, he's watching us. And so he's watching us, and, and he, he, uh, he is very angry when they rise up in our lives and challenge his dominion, his authority. God will not tolerate anyone challenging his authority. So... Moses is not rebuking the Israelites in verse 21, but he was reminding them of their special standing before God and how they must be honorable on their side of things. He is also warning them that it is a, an awesome responsibility to serve the one true God. You know, God has given us a great responsibility as children of his. Having Jesus Christ as our Savior is a responsibility. We better not blow it. We better not ruin it. But sometimes we take it for granted and we start flirting with the world. And I said, don't do it. Don't do it. Lift, lift up God in front of everything else. And don't even start gazing around the other things. So let, let's go back and, and let's focus on what, what uh, Moses was saying there in verse 21 and 22. He said in verse 21, 
He said, furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. He was angry with me. So the first thing we see, notice here, that he was not angry with the Israelites. He was angry with Moses. And that word anger is kind of interesting. You look it up. I like looking up these words in the Hebrew and stuff because sometimes we, we, we kind of lose sight of it. But uh, it means to be displeased. And of course, that's when you're angry, you're displeased, you know. Uh, you know, you get sometimes you, you get, yeah, I'm angry. I'm displeased with something. But it means more than that. This, th this word right here also means to breathe hard. And have you ever seen somebody stomp out in a huff because they're angry? <sighs> okay, I've seen that in my wife many a times. Okay, I've given her many opportunities. I've seen other people as well stomp out on me in a huff. <sighs> I've done it a few times myself. Have you ever seen a bull? When you got, and I don't know why people are insistent in running in front of bulls, they're riding on top of bulls, they're teasing bulls with red, they're doing everything they can. Have you ever seen a bull who is mad? That's a big thing. You do not, and he's got horns, okay? He's big, he can trample you, plus he can gore you. And what happens? Their nostrils start to flare out, and they breathe hard. Why? Because they're angry. And people will go out of their way because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to provoke the bull so that he's going to come at you so you somehow you can look like a hero standing in front of this thing. You might be a hero, but you're dumb, okay? Because these things don't mess with them, all right? And, and I, but I watch it time and time again. I watched it the other night. They, the people were riding the bulls. Why do they ride the bulls? And they're mad. These angry bulls. Once they kick the people off, they're still angry. They want to kill everybody. So you got guys drown, running around in clown suits trying to get their attention. Then he wants to kill the clowns. Who wants to kill a clown? Don't you love a clown? They scare me, so I'm going to kind of appreciate the bull. But when the flaring of that, that anger, and that, so when I got, saw that, that, that the, the, it comes from the, the, the meaning of to breathe hard, I'm thinking, oh, I don't ever want to see that in God toward me i never want him to to turn up his his nostrils and and, and be angry with me uh, I, I don't want to see it in my direction and you may be, may be thinking to yourselves well i'm a born again child of god uh, god will never be angry with me god will never punish me i'm under the blood of his son jesus christ all right now just because i said you can't lose your salvation does not mean that you cannot be uh, under his anger where he's angry with you and he'll do some things let me tell you so uh he certainly did get mo angry with moses didn't he he got angry with him god's anger was meted out upon him now just go uh ahead of book to uh joshua joshua chapter 1 verse 1 the very beginning of the next book over joshua 1 verse 1 i want you to see something here god's anger was meted out upon him Joshua 1 verse 1, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, and unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. I love verse 2, Moses, my servant. When I look at this, even though God was angry with Moses, even though that God took his life prematurely and he never got to, to set foot over on the promised land, he still referred to him as Moses, my servant, is dead. He is my servant. He is dead. All right. That tells me something that he still held Moses in high esteem. He is my servant, but I still have to punish him. I still don't let him get away with things. And I, I look at that with Moses, and it's a, certainly a good warning for me. So God does get angry with his children. And, but then again, you might be thinking, well, that's the Old Testament. That's the old stuff. What about the New Testament? We're, you know, we're, we're under, under the, the blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm glad you've asked me that question. Over to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the New Testament, does God get angry with His people? I'm not talking about lost, unsaved people who don't like God, who are atheists or, or, or pagans or whatever. I'm talking about born-again Christians who cherish and love Jesus Christ as their Savior. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, is a passage from which, from time to time, almost every time, I think it's every time, I, I do the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, the communion. Every time I do that, I, I go over this passage. It says there, 1 Corinthians 11, 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Okay, so Paul's talking to these Corinthians. 
this church, these are born-again people. He says, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, and that's an adject, or I'm sorry, an adverb. In other words, they're doing it, they're either in a party mode or they're taking him for granted. They're not taking it seriously, okay? It's not talking that they were unworthy, they weren't saved. No, they're saved, but they're doing it unworthily. Shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation. Not talking about losing your salvation here. He says you're going to be destroyed here on the earth. You're talking about your own destruction. Just damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And here it is in verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. He doesn't say some. The odd one. He said right now, and this was a very worldly church. This was a Laodicean church even back then. Okay? It was the church of the people. It was all about them. God took second place, even at the Lord's table. It was all about them. It was about them having merriment and food and having a good time. And it was always second place. And as I said, we looked at it. God is an angry God. He will not tolerate that, especially from His own. And so he's looking here, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means they're already dead. They had premature deaths because they were playing games with their Lord. And it says in verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And that's why he say, examine yourself. Don't worry about your neighbor, worry about you. We're always worried about everybody else, aren't we? We're worried about our kids, we're worried about our parents, we're worried about our neighbor, we're worried about the person next to you over there. And he said, this is one of those times where you better worry about you. Okay, this is, this is really something here. So, the Lord was angry. Moses said, the Lord was angry with me. It would be wise. It would be wise for us to understand this. God did not. God did not let Moses go unpunished. God did not let those members of the Corinthian church go unpunished. He says, I have requirements for you. Yes, you'll have eternity in heaven with me. But let me tell you something. If you cross me and you start disobeying, see, we, we, we take it flippantly. We, we just uh, Christians today, wake up. Wake up. We serve this awesome, holy God who has all the power to destroy us, and yet, only for one person's sake, His Son, Jesus Christ's sake. That's the one thing before, between you and Him going like this, taking you and casting you directly into the lake of fire and have you burn for all eternity. We have one person between us and that anger, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that makes Him even more angry. He says, I've given you grace I pardon you from that, and you go and you continue to live like I don't exist. I'm not big in your life anymore. And it's like, if you can fit me in, can you squeeze me in in your, your schedule? So he didn't put up with it with Moses. And Moses is a much greater man than myself, I'll tell you that much. He didn't put up with it with, with the people in 1 Corinthians, and some of them might have been nice, great, super people. But he will not tolerate what sometimes we tolerate. Sometimes we make the mistake, I think, that we think God is like us. He'll overlook it. No, he does not. He has to hold everything into accountability. That's why even after you're saved, even after you're trusted Jesus Christ, even after you have eternal life, if you want to have God's blessings while you're still remaining on this earth, you better fall in line with him and say, yes, sir. And he says, jump, say, how high? Man, Canadians don't get that, do we? You know how hard it is to run a business in Canada? You can't get people to get out of bed to go to work. Lazy, good for nothing. It's really. It's like, you owe me something. No, you get to work. You get to work at time and you do your job. And then you get paid. That's all we owe you. Today, man, it's like, are you okay, Johnny? Are you okay? And I don't mean Johnny, Johnny. I'm just using Johnny as... I've got to watch that. Are you okay? Is there a Susie here? Hey, are you okay? I've got to use the names here. But are you okay? Is everybody okay here? Are you happy? And because they're afraid because there's a shortage of, 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 you know, there's a shortage of workers. And so we're taking advantage of it. But we think God's like that. God is not like, God does not need you. God does not need me. He, 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 I mean, he could just level me and replace me like that. He could replace you the same way. Not one of us he needs. I'm just... I'm so grateful that he wants us, that he loved the world so much. He wants you here, but he doesn't need you here. And so the, he's got a different judgment than man is, is, is used to, especially here in Canada. So the Lord was angry with me, going back to Deuteronomy 4. The, the Lord was angry with me and swear that I should not go over Jordan. So uh, looking back on, on the life of Moses, uh, we find that... Uh, 
that he was not able to go. He was not able, he could see the promise. He was not allowed to walk over there. Can you imagine that? Uh, Moses was a, was a zealot for the Hebrews, for the Hebrew people. I mean, he, early on in his life, before he really had God in his life, he, he didn't want the, the Jews to be uh, under the, the, you know, the, the oppression. It was so oppressed over there in Egypt. And even though he was raised in a privileged place, he, he was very zealous. He reminds me of the Apostle Paul, who was very zealous for, for the Hebrew people in the New Testament times. And it, he, they had that kind of mentality, and God was able to use them. And we find that he was a man specifically chosen by the Lord to lead the greatest journey that this world has ever seen. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it was like for 40 years to lead some 2 million people around in a desert for 40 years? Now, some scholars, they say the estimate, they're going by the records in the Bible, and the estimate is between about 600,000 people to a little over 2 million people. Some people think it was well over 2 million people. But the, the consensus is about 2 million people. Let's, let's go on the short side of it. London has about 400,000 people in the city proper, so they say. Okay, I think there's more than that. But let's say there's 400,000. Can you imagine every man, woman, child, old person, and everything else, every pregnant woman out there and everything else, gathering them all together in carts and, and throwing all their worldly possessions on there and some extra possessions, get, uh, riches you, you got from the Egyptians, and taking the entire city, one man, taking the entire city of only 400,000, he had about 2 million, taking them out and saying, let's go out into the desert for 40 years. Wow. And he was faithful. I mean, that's 40 years. And he starts, oh, here's the other thing. He's 80 years old when he starts this. 80 years old. And he's, out there, he's got this staff and he's walking and God has given him some people to help him. He's got his brother, he's got his sister, he's got some other, some faithful men there that, to help him. But he himself is the man that God's leading him as he leads the entire city, maybe three or four of the cities of London together in a desert for 40 years, walking around and around and around without a GPS or compass or anything else. Wow. And those people are like us today. They were grumpy. Could you imagine waking up in the morning? And it's hot because you're in a desert. It's dry. And you're in a desert. And then you get this manna from heaven. But you know what? Even the best of foods, if you're eating them every single day for 40 years, oy vey, no wonder these Hebrews were getting a little angry with Moses. And they're like, when are we getting to this promised land? And, you know, our memories aren't so good. They were starting to think, you know, maybe Egypt wasn't so bad. Yeah, Egypt was worse. But you forget, you know, after you're looking at your current situation, you start getting fond memories of what it was like to be a slave and abused and had no life there. But you start to, to and this is what he was dealing with. And so we, we see this, this issue that was going on. Forty years of love and suffering and service to the Lord. What did this long-suffering faithful servant do that was so bad that God said to him, you will never set your foot in the promised land. He was so faithful. He was so zealous for God's people. Forty years of faithfulness, speaking and dealing. He had to deal with issues every single day. His father-in-law had to say to him, hey, look, you've got to bring some other men in and let them be some judges too. You can't do this all by yourself. It's killing you. You can't do this. And so he, he did this. Well, look over to Numbers. I want you to see it. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. The book of Numbers... Back a book there. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. We're going to see what was so bad that this faithful servant of God was punished severely. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam, that's his sister, died there and was buried there. Okay, that's another thing. He had to bury loved ones in the desert, never to see, never to have a, a headstone or anything like that again, leaving them behind. He was faithful. Verse 2, And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Boy, can you imagine? Two million people, and they're angry with you, okay? And they're gathering. 
Verse 3, And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have ye, look, now they're, blame, they're blaming Moses for this and his brother. I mean, they didn't bring him up out of Egypt. That was God that did that. Why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness? And we and our cattle should die there. So now there's a we and they. All of a sudden, we don't have a harmony, do we? You guys did this to us. Forget about God. You guys did this. And then we and you and we. And it's in verse 5. And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this, unto this evil place? Okay, this is where the God, God's directing them, but now they're calling it an evil place. It is not no place of seed or figs or vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. In other words, what happened to the land flowing with milk and honey? We were promised this promised land that was supposed to be amazing. And they're supposed to have gardens everywhere. And everywhere. Where is it? There's not even water here. It's nothing. And Moses and Aaron went, and here's a smart thing they did in verse 6. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, now this is very important, verse 8, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water. Wait a minute, his water? Why, why, why is the Lord God, why is Jehovah per, personalizing this, this, he's personifying this, this rock? The rock, his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them the water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. Or drink. Verse 9. Uh, starts off right, verse 9. And Moses took the rod from before uh, the Lord as he commanded him. Okay, that's pretty good. He's, he's obeying. Here's where it starts to get messy. Verse 10. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Uh-oh. He's getting angry. Must we fetch you out or fish you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he spoke to the rock. No, he did not speak to the rock. He smote the rock. He didn't just smite it once. He smote it twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, he says, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So here in the book of Numbers, we are given the exact reason for God's anger upon Moses. This is what he was talking about over in Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses was faithful, but as we see, he was not perfect. He had an anger issue. We see it earlier in his life too. And it, the anger got the best of him. Did you know Satan will use your anger? I got holy anger. Well, be, be sure that it is holy anger because usually it's, it's the, the self, it's the flesh, and Satan uses us against ourselves. So there are four acts of disobedience Moses committed here that brought God's uh, judgment upon him. And I call these four acts of disobedience, I call them the Moses syndrome because they are a pattern that if we follow up to that pattern, we're going to end up in the same mess that he ended up with. So let's examine them and let's examine ourselves and let's make sure that we don't fall into the Moses syndrome. The first thing we see is Moses disobeyed a direct command from God. There are some things in the Bible that are just direct commands. And this was one of them. Numbers 20, verse 8 said this. Uh, Numbers 20, verse 8 said, Take the rod uh, um, and speak unto the rock. Okay? Take the rod and gather thou the assembly, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak unto the rock. So there it is. There it is. Speak unto the rock. Then you slip down there to verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. So clearly Moses was commanded to speak to the rock, not hit it. Not only did he hit it once, he hits it twice. It's not an accident. He means to hit this rock when he's not supposed to. And at an earlier time in Israel's travels, when, when God was, was uh, brought forth rock, uh, water from a rock over in Exodus chapter 17, Moses was commanded to hit the rock once. 
at one time, on one occasion. He was commanded to do that. But God's instructions were different here. God wanted Moses to trust him. And especially after they had been in such a close relationship for so many years, he said, I want you to, uh, I want you to, you, Chris, you want, you, you okay? Yeah, we're working. They're, they're okay. All right. I say, praise God, praise God we got kids. Don't you worry about it, okay? And the people here all mean that too. Praise God for that. All right. If you need help, Rod will help you. No, that's a, and I'm trying to think. I, kids. Oh. Well, all the, and he's not striking with the rod. I just got thinking, Rod, it was in the Bible. Okay, so I'll get back to the scripture here before I get off on tangents, which they so easily do. But God's instructions here were different for him. He was not to strike the rock. He was supposed to speak to the rock. Moses didn't need to use force. He should have just trusted God. But he, I, I, I'll tell you something, you've got to watch your anger, because he was, he was flared with anger, and uh, he became disobedient to the Lord. And he did what he wasn't supposed to do. And that's something I can ask you. How is your obedience with the Lord? His direct commands now. They're in the Bible. I mean, are you suffering from the Moses syndrome? Are you saying, yeah, I know that God wants this, but he'll overlook this. He didn't overlook it with Moses. There's other places, and we've looked at one of them in the New Testament. He does not overlook sin. Ananias and Sapphira is another example. A couple of liars who tried to lie against God himself. He holds us accountable. I've learned that we really need to be careful with what we do in our lives. So make sure you're, you're not letting the circumstances of life cloud your gaze upon, uh, upon the, the Lord. Uh, make sure that you're walking in faith and you are, are, are not succumbing to what Moses did and let the anger get to you. Because that's what happened to him. He let, he let something get in the way and it just took his mind off what he was supposed to do. So Moses disobeyed a direct command. He was supposed to speak to the rock, not hit the rock. And we saw he hit it once and he hit it a second time. There was no accident. Second thing we see is that Moses took credit for bringing forth water. It's kind of interesting. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10, he, he says, Must we, talk about him and his brother, must we fetch you water out of this rock? He's really angry at these people, right? And even though God used Moses' actions as a means of getting water, who was the source of the water? It was God. So sometimes we think because God's using us, we all of a sudden, we, we start, we, we get into this, this same kind of sin where we start taking credit for things. We better be careful because God might be using you for this time and this day and age, and he might be blessing somebody and through you, but he's just, again, you're the means. He's the source. Moses forgot that. Moses was angry. Moses said he was calling out rebellious. I mean, and who would blame him? 40 years of whining and crying, I don't have water and no food. It's too hot, it's too dry, it's too this. And it's like 40 years of sin. And he goes away for a little while and he comes back. And what did they do? They made images and they were worshiping images and they were dancing and playing and carrying on like God didn't exist. And how, I don't know how Moses did it. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I have a lot of, you shouldn't be sympathizing with this sinner, but I, I, I sympathize with him in this way because I put myself in that spot. How do you do it for 40 years? That's tough. That's really tough. See, if I have a problem with the church, I can leave you guys and go to another church, and so can you. It's really hard to leave the camp when you're out there in the desert, and only one guy has got the direction. You've got to kind of hang with him, and he's got to hang, he's stuck with them too. So I looked at him thinking, he just couldn't swim. Hey, you know what? You two million people, you give me a hassle. There's another two million people over here, just down the street. I'll go join them. There's no other two million people. And God's taken you and placed you here, and you better... And he did the best he can. But I look at it, and God does not overlook these things. But he was starting to take credit for it. And, and Moses was guilty of, of this. Uh, I mean, if God has given you a gift, maybe, maybe it's a gift of preaching, teaching, uh, a gift of singing, maybe it's a, a gift of soul winning, uh, maybe it's a gift of leading, maybe it's a gift of consoling, maybe it's a gift of encouraging, uh, or any other kind of service that God has gifted you with, give you ability to do, please don't fall into that syndrome and think, well, look at what I'm doing. And don't let anger get to you. Because sometimes that happens. You know, sometimes you sit there and you think, do you understand what I'm doing for you? 
You see, you know, what, what are you doing? You, you're forgetting that if you're just a channel. It's God's doing it. And sometimes we think we take it too personal. When we get angry, we want to defend our, our honor. And we get up there, and we're not defending God's honor. We're trying to defend our honor. Do you not understand what I've had to put up with? Do you not understand the sacrifices I've made? Blah, 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 blah. You know what? That's exactly what Moses was saying. You rebellious, you stiff-necked people. Do you, know, do you want us to bring forth water to you? He forgot, wait a minute. This is God's idea. Remember, they fell, on their, their, they fell on their face before God, and he said, God said, this is my plan. This is not your plan, Moses. This is not you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to channel through you, but I'm the source, and I am the plan here. Don't you dare criticize me, and don't take credit for it. So, God loves a humble servant. Satan will do anything he can to make you angry so that you will defend your honor and turn off God and start defending yourself. And, uh, I mean, a, a person's uh, anger will draw them to look away from God and to focus on what they have done. We've, we do it all the time. Pastors know this. We know this syndrome very, very well. Sometimes you'll sit, you sit there and you'll, you'll study the Word and you'll, you'll labor in the Word and then you've got to deal with other issues in the church and other issues and this and that and other things with your family and with yourself and everything else. And you finally get the sermon together and you put together a service and you get the singers and everybody's in place and everybody, everybody's there and you show up and then you find out certain people didn't show up when they could have. Not No, they weren't on vacation. No, they weren't sick. No, they didn't have to work. Uh, they just decided, nah. Do you know what that does to a preacher, humanly speaking? Don't you understand what I have done this week? Don't you understand? And then we take the Moses syndrome gets to us. And as I said, it got to Moses, it certainly get to me, it get to everybody else. And so you get to that point, you don't understand what I've sacrificed for you people. And I realize this, here's, here's my way out of that, is I haven't sacrificed a single thing. I'm just getting blessings from God. God's putting me in there. No, it's not always easy. But you know what? It's God. This is his plan. He's the source of everything. And if I show up and nobody shows up, I will preach the message. And I'm, I've determined this. I, if nobody, please show up next week. But if you don't show up, nobody shows up, I'm going to preach it anyway. I'm going to preach it. The Lord gave it to me. I'll preach it to Jesus and give him the glory. And all of a sudden, when you start looking at it that way, because you learn from Moses, you learn the good things and the bad things. When you do it that way, all of a sudden, you don't get so uptight. It's not all about you. It's not what did I say. It's not, you're not taking credit for anything. And so God, I got to fellowship with the Lord this week. I got to, to study his word, to write these things. I, I got to do these things. I, I remember one, one service, um, maybe I mentioned it here before, but we had a service when I was young. I was in my, I think, late 20s. Uh, the church that I started in Fort Erie, and uh, I, I brought, yeah, I did mention this uh, probably about a year ago, Let's see if you remember, uh, if you were listening, um, it was, uh, and, and what I had is I had uh, an evangelist come, and his sons, his two sons, so the evangelist, and he had this great big fifth wheel, he comes in, and both of his sons had big fifth wheels, and their families, and they had kids, and you know, the grandkids, and everybody else, and they came up from the states, we didn't pay for it, I'm just starting a church here, and, and I've had some people at the church, we had some good services going, we had them come in, the try to encourage people to understand that we have a church starting here in Fort Erie come on out to it and so they went up to this trailer park and they got all their their stuff and their camp all together and they had a service and they, they, we had a fairly good win, uh, Sunday service and then we had a Wednesday evening service and I was working at the time and I was looking at the clock and I had to work part of the evening and, and uh, work for a, a customs brokerage and finally the boss said you can go so I booked it under there and I got to the church opened up the door and they were all at the front praying just the evangelist and his family. Nobody showed up. Now, I didn't have to pay anything. That was all supported. Somebody paid for that. Uh, churches in the States were trying to help people in Canada. Nobody showed up. Sucks the life right out of you. Gone. It's like, oh, man. And, but I started to learn. I started to learn. I went through some, some of these, these rough spots. And at that time, it's like, you want to quit, but it, and sometimes you do quit from time to time, and then God just kicks you. Remember, remember Peter? He goes, I go fishing. I've had it. <laughs> I, I, I give it all my best. I'm going back to fishing. And, there's, and the Lord says, no, 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 get back here. That was a training thing for you. And so there's some training things that we have to have. And one of the things I've learned is that whether people show up or not, can, can, it, it's not a sin to be disappointed, I mean, there's no, no sin for Moses to be upset and disappointed that way. But the, the sin is how we react to it. 
And we start taking it personally. So I look at this stuff and, and, and I see what, what happens. The third thing we see, not only did Moses take credit for, for being, uh, bringing forth the water because he was angry and he was trying to defend himself, but Moses also abused the type of Christ. Christ is the rock that brings forth living water. Man, I've got a spring of living water inside my soul, and it's Jesus Christ. He brings that forth to me, new every day. Man, it's good. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, get to know him. Get to know what that's like in a, in a dry land. Boy, I tell you something, Canada is a dry land. This world is a dry land, no matter where you go. This rock was a picture, this Old Testament picture of the coming Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. And did all drink of that same spiritual drink. And they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, and followed them. And that rock was Christ. It was an Old Testament picture. A type of Jesus Christ. A teaching, a lesson that we could use in the church age. So what was he doing? He was striking the Lord Jesus Christ when he was striking that rock. That was the picture. It says it right there in, in, in uh, that, that verse there. Um, in 1 Corinthians. Now, the, this rock, like Christ, was to be beaten once and only once for the sin of the world. Exodus 17, verse 6. And behold, I will stand before thee, therefore upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock. This was the one time, the one time Moses was commanded to strike the rock. And there shall come forth water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of, uh, of Israel. So there was one time, in this picture of the rock, there was one time he was to strike it, he was supposed to smite it. But if you look over, and it's, that's the other verse that's there, Hebrews 7, verse 27, it says, Who needeth not daily, talking about Jesus, as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for their own sins and then for the people's, for this he, talking about Jesus Christ, he did once when he offered himself up. Jesus Christ was to be beaten once for our sakes. He was to be hung on the cross once for us. Once and once only. That type which is Jesus Christ, that rock which is Jesus Christ was to be struck, was to be smitten once. Not a second time, not a third time, once. Because once is good enough. Once is enough to pay for the sins of the whole world. So, so Moses uh, was to present this type and he was supposed to uh, show what was going to happen when Jesus Christ came. And additionally, he was supposed to speak to the rock. And speaking to the, the rock, was, 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 which brings forth the, the living waters, rather, he struck the rock. The, the speaking to the rock is like prayer. After he was struck the rock previously, the next time he was supposed to speak to the rock. When you want to get saved, you don't have to hang Christ up on the cross all over again. You know what you need? Get down on your hands and knees and pray. Speak to the rock which is Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I am a sinner before you, before God the Father. Before this whole world, I declare that I am a sinner. I'm hopeless. I'm turning to you. I'm turning from the world, turning from myself. I'm repenting, and I'm turning to you. Be my one and only Savior. I accept that sacrifice that you did on the cross once. He doesn't have to be hung there again. So, let's be careful that we do not suffer from the same Moses syndrome and start putting Christ back up on the cross again. And that is, happens every time we add works or religion to what Jesus Christ has already done. Including prayers, burning candles, or crucifixes. Why don't I wear a crucifix? I don't have a much of a problem with crosses so much. Why don't I put... Because Jesus Christ is not on the cross. Do you understand? He's off the cross. Well, it'll teach them, you know, what happens, and I've seen what people do, is they start getting rosaries, they start getting little crosses, crucifixes, and stuff of that nature, and all of a sudden, they start to mean more than they ought to. And they, I can't pray without my cross. Where, where's my crucifix? Where's, where's Jesus? I need to look at, listen, graven images, graven images, graven images. You say, preacher, you're wrong. I say, preacher, I'm right, because we have already read it. Jesus, or God said himself, the Father, Jehovah, he said, you will not make a graven image. You will not do anything like that. I am your God, and you will worship me in truth and in spirit. This, these are the things that we must learn. But so many times we let things creep in. We do it all the time. We, we, we let superstition. We, let to, we, we, we all have this like knock on wood. We do all these the Christians doing that. You know, uh, being afraid of certain days. I've mentioned to you probably before too, I'm afraid of the number 13. My brother was, died on Friday the 13th. That stuck in my mind when I was eight years old. Eight years old, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th is bad, it's bad, it's bad, bad. I have to overcome that. 
There, I, I try to avoid the number 13. And then I have to see, this is something I have to fight in my life because it's Satan trying to get a hold in there. And that is, is that there is one God, one God only, and this superstitious is a fear of Satan. And I do not fear Satan anymore. I respect his power. He's more powerful than I am. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I've learned that too. And so I, and I want you to be on the same journey I am, and that is cast away a lot of these superstitions, religions, good works, anything you're trying to add to the beautiful grace that God has bestowed upon us when he took his son once and once only and had him beaten and died on a cross. Oh, we don't need to put him up there again. It was good enough. Jesus himself said, it is finished. Why do we keep putting him up there? It's finished. It's over. So finally, we will get to this. And folks, I'm telling you, I'm coming in for a landing here. And that is, is not only uh, did he abuse the type of Christ, but Moses committed the sin. And this is probably what really got him. Moses committed the sin of the disobedience, these sins, publicly. If you've got your Bibles over there, Numbers 20, verse 8. Numbers 20, verse 8. I want you to see this. And I think this is really why Moses had to declare to the people, I won't be going with you across over into the promised land. Numbers 20, verse 8. Take the rod, and here it is, gather thou the assembly together. In other words, I'm going to have you do something, Moses, and everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to be watching you, all eyes upon you. He says, thou and Aaron, thy brother, here it is, and speaking unto the rock, where? Before their eyes. He says, I've got something for you to do, and this is, and he's talking about testimony now. You're my man, Moses. You stand up there, you do exactly what I told you to do. You speak to that rock, and they're all going to be amazed. Just speaking to that rock, they're going to see all that water come out. And they're going to know that you're the true, the true follower of me, and they're going to follow you for my sake. And what did he do? He turned around in front of everybody, and he was so angry telling them, he was so blinded in his rage, he was so think, taking credit for himself, he's going through all these sins. In front of everybody else, he strikes the rock. And he does it twice, and he does it in front of everybody. And he commits this great sin. And God said, because you did this in front of everybody, i got to pun publicly punish you too. Here's the warning to us. Watch your testimony. Because God's watching it. Watch your testimony. If you name Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, watch what you do in front of other people. Another lesson I've had to learn. Watch what you do. Be careful. Because if we get ourselves and we start doing things that we ought not to do, God's going to have to punish us because he is a holy and just God. He's going to have to take us out to the woodshed and, and teach us some lessons. When I looked at this and I saw what had happened, I, I said, Let's, let us not fall into this Moses syndrome. And uh, I'll just close with, with uh, Joshua uh, 1 verse 2, and we've already looked at it. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. We must guard ourselves. We must make sure, we must make sure that we are not disobedient to the commands of God. We must make sure that we are giving full credit to God for all the miracles. If God's done anything in your life, don't take credit for it. Give it to God. Praise God for it. I'll tell you something, he loves that. And if you're humble and you do that, God will bless you. He will, okay? I'm not a, a televangelist. I'm not going to say give money. God's going to give you a whole bunch of money, buy you a house. But I will say this much because I see it. In, it's, it's, the, it's the character who God is. God loves a person who's faithful. God loves a person who will humble himself. He resists the proud. The Bible says that. But he opens up the doors of blessings to those who will willfully humble themselves and give them the credit. So let's make sure that we don't do, fall into the, the syndrome of Moses. Let us be careful that we don't add anything to the grace of God because our very lives are a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and the new life in Christ. When we baptize somebody, yes, it's the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we baptize by water immersion here. And the same thing is it also pictures you're dead to your old way of life. You're new in Jesus Christ. Well, then we better be the testimony that proves that because God's watching and he doesn't play games. And so we got to watch what we do in front of other people. Shall we bow our heads, close our eyes, please? Father.